Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Washington. Last week, commenting about the Euro crisis, President Obama said, there's lots of wealth in Europe. They can solve this crisis if they want to. Well, certainly that could also apply to the United States. And a new study by the Perry Institute looks at one of the places the money is. And that's in big banks and big corporations who have been able to borrow from the Fed at practically 0% interest. Big banks are sitting on about $1.6 trillion. Big corporations, something in the range of $2 trillion. And the Perry Institute report analyzed if you allow uh, reserves for the banks and you look at short-term liabilities of the corporations, they could still put into the productive economy an investment somewhere in the range of about $1.4 trillion. And what would that look like? Well, now joining us from the Perry Institute in Amherst, Massachusetts, is Bob Poland, one of the authors of the report. Bob is the founder or co-director of the Perry Institute. Thanks for joining us again, Bob. Thank you very much for having me, Paul. So first of all, how, how do you get to these numbers and how do, they, how do the banks and corporations get so much cash and why are they just sitting on it? Well, the way we get to the numbers is right out of the data from the U.S. flow of funds accounts, which is statistical data coming out of the Federal Reserve. So we're not making anything up. It's all coming right from data from the Federal Reserve. So if you look at the Federal Reserve data, the U.S. commercial banks have cash reserves sitting at the Fed of, as you said, $1.6 trillion, which is an extraordinary number. There's never been anything like it. Uh, as a counterpoint, right before the recession, the banks were sitting on $20 billion total in cash in 2007. Now, the, the $20 billion is way too low, but the $1.6 trillion is ridiculously high. Yeah, you, you make the point in your report, this is something like 23% of the U.S. GDP. If you add together the $1.6 trillion sitting on, uh, that the banks are sitting on, and the $2 trillion that the non-financial corporations have in liquid assets, $3.6 trillion, that's 23% of U.S. GDP sitting right there. One quarter of the entire uh, level of activity in the entire economy. Now, the other point you make in the report is that actual borrowing from small business is, is a net negative since 2009. So all this cash sitting over here, and it's not getting loaned out into the economy. Yeah, these patterns are absolutely extraordinary. As someone who has looked at these data, the flow of funds accounts, for 30 years now, there's never been anything like it. The, the small business sector, or more precisely, the non-corporate sec business sector of the economy, which is mostly small businesses, has actually uh, been a net uh, negative in terms of borrowing since 2008. In 2008, they went to negative 346 billion. That is, they were paying back 346 billion more than they were taking in in new loans. Now, how can an economy recover when the businesses are just paying back loans and don't have any money to spend on hiring people or investing in equipment? So that was 2009. As of this past year, 2011, they're still, the small business sector as a whole is still at net negative. So that's where the bottleneck is in the economy. We've got 1.6 trillion that the banks are sitting on that they got for free, and we have businesses, small businesses, net negative in terms of borrowing to expand their operations. Now, what, one of the things when we say sitting on, it's not actually quite accurate, sitting on, because as we've talked about in some of our previous interviews, the banks are using some of this money in what they're calling the carry trade and loaning it into places like Brazil where they're getting an interest spread. But in your report, you talk about something else, is that the corporations sitting on some of this 0% money are actually using it for share buyback schemes and such instead of investing in, in new production. Talk a bit about that. Okay, so the, the non-financial corporations are holding $2 trillion in liquid assets. And what we did throughout this study is we tried to work with extremely conservative assumptions as to what's a reasonable number as to how much they should actually be holding and not just jump up and down about $2 trillion without analyzing that number, $2 trillion. 
So we looked at their liabilities, how much the corporations owe, and short-term liabilities in particular, how much they're going to owe, have to pay back over the next year. And it turns out that uh, the, if we look at the ratio of this total amount of cash to liabilities, the cash is only about 55% of total liabilities. So they actually have more in liabilities than they have in cash. So we take account of all of that and we look at the ratio of liquid assets of the corporations relative to liabilities as that has held in previous years. And we said that of that total two trillion, about 400 billion, we can very conservatively argue is excess, is way more than they need to meet their needs in terms of their debt. So 400 billion in the, with the uh, financial, non-financial corporations is, is money just sitting there that they should be using for investment. The reason the banks are not loaning more, the reason companies are not uh, investing more in more productive capacity and more employment, you point out is that the underlying issue here is lack of demand. So, I mean, it's not like these guys wouldn't prefer to expand. It's that they, they don't see a, a profitable place to do it. So demand is certainly one issue. I don't think it's the only issue. I think it's also fair to say that there is a credit lockout for small businesses. So I would say it's, a, it's that combination of two things. But the first is certainly demand because banks, corporations, Look, they're in business to make money. If they thought that they could make money by spending this cash that they're sitting on, on hiring people, expanding operations, then we have to assume they would do so. So they, ha they have reached the conclusion that it's not worth their while to put the money into job creation and investments. So how do you fix that? You have to raise the level of demand in the economy. That's the first fix. All right, that means higher wages. More jobs and higher wages. It means more jobs and more higher wages. And by the way, we do when, when we calculate the job creation uh, of putting 1.4 uh, trillion into the economy, we assume that wages are going up. So what we say in the study that you're going to get 19 million new jobs. You can get 19 million new jobs over three years by putting the money 1.4 trillion, that we are also taking account of workers getting wage increases, 3% wage increases a year. So that is, we are building wage increases into the economy. They, these are things that should happen. They might not happen. So talk about what you would do with 1.4 trillion. How does, how does this actually operate? Like if they don't want to loan it, then you're suggesting the government needs to play a role here. What is that role and how does this happen? Well, the government's role, first of all, back to your previous point, is to stimulate demand in the economy. That means we need, we definitely do need another stimulus. Uh, we can't sit around and wait, just wait for businesses to figure out that the market is better than it seems. So we, we at the very least, we need to reverse any notion, any semblance of an austerity agenda as being favorable to creating jobs in the economy. So number one, yes, we need to defend st spending at the state and local level, and we need the government to support that. And that will be the driver of job creation. And then number two, we need the banks to start lending money to small businesses. Small businesses are getting turned down at a rate of about 60% for loans. And that is not going to help us get the small businesses back on their feet. So, okay, how do we do that? So yes, we need to de stimulate demand, and then we need to impose a tax on banks who uh, are sitting on this money because it's just too cushy for them to hold this money that they get at a zero interest rate. So we need to, uh, first of all, stop paying the banks. The banks are getting paid one quarter of 1% to just sit on money that they got for free. So why shouldn't they just keep sitting on it? So uh, you need to start taxing the, what we call the excess reserves of the banks and keep taxing them until we start to see the banks getting movement and starting to find uh, investment opportunities. So you looked at the effect of this. So if the 1.4 trillion does get into the productive economy, what does that mean in terms of employment? What's the effect of this? 
1.4 trillion would create 19 million jobs over three years. We just assume it will take three years to get that level amount of money into the economy, and it will raise total employment from its current level at about 140 million to almost 160 million, 159 million. In terms of the unemployment rate, just this moving this money into the economy itself will drive unemployment down below 5%. So back to your quote from Obama, the situation in the United States is this. We can solve the jobs crisis with the money that is just sitting there doing nothing, either with banks or with the non-financial corporations. The other objection is likely to come is this will be inflationary, all, this, all these new jobs and higher wages that result from this. Uh, so you've, what, what does the inflation picture look like? Well, we could use a little inflation, Inf a little inflation that is generated by the economy growing, by there being more demand in the economy, by workers getting higher wages. That's good. That's good. That is not uh, a malignant form of inflation by any means. And in the study itself, we, we allow for that. We assume inflation is going to go up on average by 3% a year. So, uh, you know, inflation driven by uh, a growing economy is a byproduct of something good, growing economy with more job creation. So uh, I don't see that as bad. As long as wages don't fall behind inflation. Yes, we are assuming, and of course, I don't know if this is going to happen. We're assuming, as often happens, when workers start to get hired back into jobs, and we're creating you know, almost 20 million new jobs, we're assuming that workers' bargaining power is going to go up. And we did factor that in. So we said, even allowing for higher wages and allowing for inflation, real wages going up faster than inflation, we still get 19 million jobs. And then also we are increasing the well-being of workers. We're increasing uh, the demand capacity of the economy because we're putting money in workers' pockets. That's all. That is the engine of recovery that we need right now. And how much of this can be done without, an, uh, without Congress passing new legislation, if any? Because it doesn't seem like you can pass anything in Congress. Well, the first steps can be taken immediately. The first steps being, and certainly on the credit side, uh, that is to expand the loan guarantee program, at least improve the terms make it really, really easy for banks to start thinking about lending to small businesses. The Fed itself can eliminate the 0.25 interest that they're paying to uh, the banks right now to just sit on money. Those things can be done tomorrow. Uh, the excess reserve tax, it's possible if you call it a negative interest uh, regime by the Fed, it's possible that the, uh, that the Fed could do that without an act of Congress, maybe, I'm not sure. Certainly, uh, to have a demand stimulus to accompany this, that has to come uh, from Congress. But if, we, if, we, if you frame it in a way that's saying, look, what we're trying to do is get money into the hands of small businesses so they can hire workers, why would traditional Republicans be against that? They say they're always for small businesses. And the way that we've designed this program, it is really focused on enhancing the conditions for small businesses are getting locked out of credit markets. Okay, well, we're going to have a link to Bob's report. It will be underneath the video player here. Uh, just one, one final quick question. If, if the Fed can loan money to uh, big banks and corporations at practically 0%, could it not do the same thing to states, states and municipalities? That's a good point. And they could also make loans directly to small businesses. Uh, it would be extraordinary. It would not be what they've done before. But they've been tossing out all the rules as it is to get out of the crisis by giving money to, uh, non to, giving money to the banks, to giving money to the mutual funds. And therefore, if the banks are going to keep sitting on the money that they're getting for free, uh, it's, it's time for the Fed to think about starting uh, to do uh, direct lending into the economy. And actually, this has come up. I wouldn't say that it's a prevailing view. It has come up because the situation is so untenable. I mean, how in the world can you get a recovery when the Fed is running a zero interest rate policy and the banks won't make loans to small businesses? We don't get a recovery 
under that scenario. Thanks for joining us, Bob. Thank you very much. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network. And don't forget the donate button here. We're in the midst of our $200,000 matching campaign for 2011. If you want to keep us in business, you need to click donate. Thanks for joining us on The Real News Network.